a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream. One day, this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its dream. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friends, even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. My dream is to be a doctor and a chef. My dream is to be a pilot. My dream is to be Captain Lamb. To become a football player. To be a veterinarian and have lots of puppies. My dream is to sell ice cream. <laughs> That's good. Hello, and welcome to Anne Frank Inspire Academy's second annual Inquiry to Impact, a youth symposium exploring our future and igniting change. My name is Jojo Salinas. And I'm Jamin Rose. We are incredibly proud to be hosting an official Dream Week essay event, a citywide celebration of Dr. King's amazing civil rights legacy. As we continue to manage life amidst a pandemic, we again moved our event online. But don't worry, even though we couldn't be together physically, we still have some great things to show you. You'll be enjoying student music performances, presentations of student inquiry projects, along with a conversation Jamin and I had with several community leaders, offering advice to AFIA students on how to ignite real change. So let's get started with Ms. Rosen's K-8 music students. As Dr. King said, this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. Here's This Land Is Your Land. Nicely done, music students. At AFIA, we aren't just sitting in rows memorizing textbooks, spitting back information. That's what Siri is for. Don't forget about Alexa. Now, what makes AFIA so unique is how it respects students by allowing us to explore topics relevant to us in ways that are engaging and meaningful. In the following clip, facilitators Ms. Hernandez and Ms. Perez will briefly discuss how this inquiry process works at AFIA followed by students from East Campus demonstrating what they're working on. Excellent, enjoy. Inquiry is an opportunity to explore concepts that are pivotal in everyday life, but also crucial to our core subjects. So let's say we're learning force and motion. To begin with that, we might include um, an introduction of what force is, what kind of motion is involved um, as an outcome of that force, and then the next process of inquiry is where it really becomes cool. The facilitators step back and allow students to ask their own questions and to begin to explore their own topics. And so providing them and empowering them with that choice, they really begin to buy in to whatever it is that they are driven to explore. And it's so exciting to see that these kids are really internalizing and making those connections in the world around them. So next we have Harrison, who's gonna show you guys his inquiry project for Force in Motion. What was the topic for this inquiry project? Force in Motion. Awesome, and what is force? A push or pull. Ah, very good. So if something is being pushed or pulled, what does it create? Emotion. Emotion, emotion like what? What kinds of emotions might it create? Slide, mm -hmm. roll, and spin. Awesome job. 
All right, now show us this project that you created. And this was your idea, right? Yes. Okay, now can you tell us a little bit about your project? So if you, if, cause you can choose five Pokemon. Cause if you, one of them dies, you can have another one. And the goal is you have to try to get to the stadium. I used hot glue to glue the stands on and to glue pretty much everything. And you have this door that opens up. Okay, look. There you go. The Pokemon, they they use motion. They they use force to push their legs, and that creates a motion. Some Pokemon, they're electric. Do we like to create things? Yes. In inquiry, mm -hmm. what do we do in inquiry? We ask a lot of questions. We ask a lot of questions. Do we get to, do I just tell you what I need you to know? No. No? Thank you for letting me show you my group project. So this nine weeks inquiry was all about passions and what you're interested in. So what was the topic you chose? I, the topic I chose was how sugar affects your body. Okay. So what were some of the effects or some of the research that you found that surprised you? Okay, the ones that most surprised me where like you have crazy mood swings when you when you like have a lot of sugar, you actually you can actually like age faster. Like you get more wrinkles. Oh no, <laughs> like, <laughs> that's not what I wanted to hear. Yeah. Um, okay. Also, like you get a lot more like acne. It it like increases the risks of heart attacks. Like 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 circulation my morning coffee with all the sugar is like a no-go <laughs> yeah okay and so you did a really great job because not only did you research your project but you actually experimented on yourself right can you talk a little bit about that uh yeah i just went for a whole week without any added sugars so just like natural normal sugars i ate but any added sweeteners or sugars i didn't eat at all like this is gonna sound a little weird but i generally became like a little nicer <laughs> Like, just like, you know, but the first few days, I definitely, my family called it withdrawals <laughs> because I was like, like a little cranky and I was like super, super tired and I didn't want to like talk to anyone. So how did you record your whole inquiry process? What did you choose as your actual demonstration and project? I chose to journal it. Cool. And yeah. why did you choose journaling it? I felt it was like the best way to like get it out there. Being able to kind of experiment with yourself and like using research to then apply to yourself, like where do you see that skill being useful? I mean, for the rest of your life. Probably in like a lot of different circumstances. In the future, not consuming so much sugar. For sure. Last semester, we were doing a passion project and I chose frogs because frogs I was really interested in and I thought were super cool and they made me feel happy. My name is Kelsalyn and I'm in eighth grade. Uh, this one right here, uh, her name is Lemon and she is a Gulf Coastal Toad and this one is Cracker and he is a Texas Toad. Out in the backyard, my dad would water every night and he'll just see them hopping around and we'll catch them, we'll put them in the aquarium with the others. And then the next day we'll obviously like feed them, give them food. They are actually very interesting. They have some weird ways of defending themselves. They do help the environment of keeping specific species down and keeping the population of bad bugs down. Our topic was about saving sea animals in the ocean and how we can save them from getting hurt by all this ocean trash and pollution. We mostly chose it because we both felt passionate about it, about what it was doing to the marine life. So we wanted to make change in it. We wanted to have impact. Yes. Sea animals being affected by the trash, some died because of it and that's because of our own mistakes. Yeah. We both have posters of how these ocean animals are getting hurt by all the trash, and they are hurt in these pictures, and we tried to use this to show the people how bad it's getting. Make them feel bad, yeah. that way they'll act, make them feel bad, that way they'll like help with the problem and actually do something about it instead of yeah. just sitting around and not doing anything yeah. about it. So this right here, we both made out of recyclable items. 
um, this is our sea turtle, and it's the trash that it's some trash that hurts sea turtles, and we wanted to show these people this trash is hurting sea turtles, and all we got to do is recycle it. We go to our grocery stores every day, and all we use is plastic bags, like hundreds of them, and that eventually ends up hurting sea animals. Yeah, because you've seen plastic bags fly away in the grocery yeah. stores. You don't throw them away correctly. And these tur turtles, they mistaken them as squid or jellyfish and they they swallow them and they end up choking and dying, yeah. definitely. Like I haven't used a plastic straw since I've learned about what's happening. Yeah. I always use reusable ones. Mm -hmm. And most of my stuff is reusable at my house mm -hmm. just because I feel like I should be doing that to yeah. help. Instead of using those plastic bags that we just showed, you could use re uh, recyclable reusable bags. bags. Reusable bags, yeah. I definitely think that when you're working with a group for inquiry, that that's gonna help more for real life with your your businesses. Like if you're in business, you're gonna need to learn how to work with your coworkers more and communicate. Yeah, and communicate exactly. The be great part is really put forward here because of the opportunities that we're given. Because. That's the one thing that also has kept me coming back to the school every year is that you have the opportunity and the resources to be great. The project that I've been working on this year uh, through Inquiry was started off as an environmental-centered project um, because packaging has evolved a lot over the past um, few years and the past few decades. And now how that changed on the waste side of things because we went from glass and stone to keeping things to non-biodegradable plastic and other materials that when disposed of aren't like glass. Glass will just break down, it will melt, it'll turn back into sand. Um, and But the plastic will, even if it does degrade, it degrades in a negative way that gives chemicals into the, uh, into the surrounding environment and the soil. So I wanted to create a centralized infographic with an attached essay that really put some some big statistics in your face and some general short information. And if you wanted to go more in depth on it yourself, there was all the sources in the essay and more drawn out thoughts. He, my dad was in the restaurant industry for uh, 20 years. So the restaurants get all of their stuff in bulk, which helps reduce individual packaging waste. So a lot of uh, places like Chipotle is the main one. They have very biodegradable packaging and um, and all of their Tupperware and all of their drinks and everything. You'll notice it's the weird cardboard, like the weird looking cardboard. It's because it's all um, cornstarch packaging. And you can literally run that under water for long enough and it will just dissolve and it's completely good for, uh, for the environment and the surrounding things. So it's basically just choosing to use bulk and to use the companies that will that will be more considerate as to what goes into their products. I know that wherever I go, as long as I am finding joy and have the opportunity to be great in doing that, I am happy with what it is. I love manual labor, I also love tech, I also love food. So that's the three very different things and avenues that I can go down. So it's really wherever God takes me and whatever I find enjoyable. Great job, everyone. We look forward to following along with your progress as we look to make real change. Speaking of change, last Friday, Jojo and I sat down with several influential community leaders to gather ideas on how best to make an impact in our world. Student leaders gathered in the high school to bend the ears of our panelists and ask questions inspired by this year's Dream Week theme, Our Future, Igniting Change. Let's take a look. We are so fortunate to have with us three fantastic community leaders all here to offer their insight and wisdom to how, as to how best to plan for the future and ignite change. Mr. Howie, um, how do you go about mentoring different people? Uh, a lot of people don't feel that it's their responsibility to serve and take care of others and to mentor others. But if you think about it, none of us are gonna live long enough to make all the mistakes ourselves. So we have to learn from others. 
So the most influential person in my life has been or, and was my grandfather. He passed away at age 93. I didn't know he was my mentor at the time I was growing up. I was just learning through osmosis and through hanging out with him. And he would tell me stories about how he came from Eastern Europe, uh, wasn't allowed to come uh, right before World War II. Uh, he was Jewish. You know, the, you all have studied, I'm sure, the rise of Nazism in Eastern Europe and in Western Europe. And so he was able to escape. He had some family members already in Mexico that, ha that helped pay his way to get to Mexico. Eventually made his way to Monterey and then to Laredo, Texas, where I was eventually born. But I was raised by my parents, but I spent a lot of time with my grandparents, and specifically my grandfathers, where I learned how to give back to the community. I learned a lot from him. Now here I am at age 57, and I still think back on the lessons that I learned from my grandfather, even though he wasn't a formal mentor. So if you haven't found somebody to mentor you, I know you have teachers, you have facilitators, you have counselors. Um, Look also at maybe family members or friends of family members who are adults who do something that you would like to aspire to do or to achieve, and then ask them very simply, and as Marty said, and I'm sure Ingo second this, there's nothing more we like better than to talk and help others achieve their goals, especially once we've achieved ours. The next best thing to that is leaving some sort of legacy to help others achieve their goals. And um, as, as, as Marty so well put it, I believe that if you help enough other people get what they want, you'll always have what you want. Hello, I'm Zoe, I'm in grade eight, and I have a question for you, Ms. Cotton. Um, how did you pick your career? Thank you. I appreciate that question because yeah, for me it was not a straight line. And um, th after um, after going to law school, and then um, like I, I worked as a judicial clerk, so basically kind of ghostwriting opinions for judges. Um, I worked at a law firm doing administrative law, and then I, I got depressed. I, I my mental health was in danger, and I realized, and I felt I felt like a failure, and I felt like I had picked the wrong career. Um, you know, I was trying to check all the boxes and, and be a success, and I, I wasn't. Do succeeding at what I thought I should do. And I really had to step back and reevaluate, like, you know, that like being, being a, a complete and happy person is more meaningful than just following a checklist or, you know, sticking with the plan you made when you were 15. Um, you know, it's, it's okay to edit the plan, <laughs> right? And because you get new knowledge about how to measure success and that there's a lot more to it than just financial success or um, just, you know, the things you list on your resume, that the, the relationships you have with people and um, also taking care of yourself, like your health, you know, eating well, exercising, getting enough sleep, that those things are all really important. But I think the biggest change for me was realizing that, that service itself can be a career. I have a very, very small family. Uh, my father uh, escaped the Holocaust uh, in Europe, and he was the only member of his family to survive. And my father wanted me to be a lawyer. Well, ironically, I'm dyslexic. And... Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you right now, if I had a choice of not being dyslexic, I wouldn't choose it because I believe that being dyslexic helped me be what I am. And when you're dyslexic, you, you have a choice. Either you let dyslexia get you and you just decide to give up on everything or you learn to compensate for your weaknesses and it makes you stronger. And I believe it made me stronger. My mother was an educator and that was probably the biggest asset that she had. She was the one who guided me to not think I was stupid going to school because I wasn't a good reader. I excelled in other things, and reading was not my strong suit. So the lesson when I went off to college, my mother taught me, and probably one of the most important lessons of my life, it's going to sound crazy being at a school, my mother said, don't let the classroom get in the way of your education. You learn from your teachers every day, but you also learn from your classmates. You learn about their lives. You learn about their experiences. And uh, going through college, all the experiences that go around college, uh, meeting people, living with people. So I've, I learned that learning never stops. I'm 75 years old, and every day of my life, <clears throat> I try to learn something. So here at Anne Frank, our classrooms function very differently from a traditional public school. Um, 
we refer to the, so the teachers as facilitators because their job is to facilitate the students teaching themselves. So that really gives us a lot of room to pick something that we ourselves are interested in. So for me, um, me and my group were doing PTSD. We personally are driven to that topic for personal reasons and we really want to dive into it and look into the different kinds of PTSD that people are affected by, how it affects them in their everyday lives. So it's a lot of students deciding the lesson plan and going to find the answers that we want. And that's for all the students here at Anne Frank. And that's kind of how the school and the classes, so to speak, function. Like um, Mr. Wender said that um, don't let the classroom get in the way of the education. Really, it meets with Anne Frank's like um, teaching structure. While your education is outside the ordinary, like, like Jojo said, it's very different than the traditional school model, the expectation is that you all will grow up to become excellent and contributing members of society who live above the line, meaning take responsibility for others, serve your community. And while I agree with Marty that we should all, and, and with Inga, that we should all do what we love, I actually love people and I love riding motorcycles, so I should be delivering pizzas. But I have to balance that out with how do I make a living, provide for my wife and children? I'm an artist, I'm a painter, but I was never able to make money as an artist, but now I own an advertising agency that creates art that helps our clients sell more products and therefore they pay us hands handsomely for that work. So it's kind of a workaround and I got to fall in love with the industry that I'm in because I molded it and shaped it into something that I knew that one I can make a living at and that also that I would love to be able to do. It wasn't until later that I realized that I can use my advertising agency to help nonprofits raise more money, get more awareness, et cetera. And so now I've had the opportunity to help more than 50 nonprofits do that through my marketing expertise. Martin Luther King had a, had a dream. And um, what would one of y'all's dreams be for 10 years time? What was, what's something that you want to see change um, in the grand scheme of things, like in the, our entire community? community. Um, the change that I want to see through San Antonio Charter Moms is like not just that each kid is in the school that's the right fit and they're getting a good education, but that collectively we've closed some of the gaps because right now there are, are students in some parts of San Antonio that are more, more likely to get an education that will prepare them for college and for the career of their choice and for a life of good health and, and choices. And there's other parts of town where um, a lot of students, they're, they're not getting prepared for the future. Like they they may, even if they get a diploma, they might not be really functional in reading and writing. Um, very few of those students are going to college or completing their college degrees. They have limited choices about what careers they have. It affects their health. It affects their housing. Um, it affects their choices in life. And um, it, it really bothers me that there's so much disparity across our city. And education is the key to changing that. And that's one of the reasons why I communicate so much about school choices. I feel like if we can arm parents with information and students with information, um, they can get themselves into uh, schools that will open up doors for them. And, and Frank is a really important part of that school landscape because it's offering a distinctly different model, inquiry-based learning, and it really gives students a lot of power to, to take charge of their education and think about their futures. If, if, if I could change anything, uh, and something I am working on, is giving the right recognition, the right compensation to teachers. They are the most important people. Uh, they, 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 we, we put our trust into teachers to take our children to become adults, and um, we're not paying enough attention to that. We can all make a huge difference and a, and a big impact, but it starts with you and it starts with an idea. There's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And just like Inga had that idea and it started off as, I don't know exactly what I'm doing, but I'm gonna start doing some research. I'm gonna start putting stuff up on the internet. And then lo and behold, it becomes this nonprofit that people support that is now on the map of Anne Frank Inspire Academy. And I know that we have a collaboration with them. So, it starts with an idea, and then it takes a lot of elbow grease.
because I can tell you that uh, Marty Winder didn't develop Westover Hills where SeaWorld is and, and the hospital group over there and, and all the housing and everything else that's out there uh, without having a big idea and then without having people to help support that idea. Um, so for me is probably to see some research in the curing of type 1 diabetes. My mother um, suffers from type 1 diabetes. She was diagnosed when she was, I believe, nine years old. And growing up, that was really different because I would always see her taking the different shots at restaurants. And I personally always thought that was normal. My mother always says it. Um, she would love to see some kind of big organization or some kind of more research being put into that to try and cure it because as it is, it's an incurable disease. And she's learned to live with it, but I would love to see in the future some more awareness brought about it and more research being done to try and get rid of it permanently. Would you like to share any of your final thoughts to the students here at Enfrank? Life is a mirror. It reflects back on you what you are. Life doesn't give you what you want, it doesn't always give you what you pray for. It doesn't give you even what you work very hard to attain. Life is reflecting back on you what you are. What you put out into the universe, what you put out into the community, is usually what you're going to get back. But it seems that the more good I put out, the more good comes back to me. The more bad I put out, negativity, complain, etc., the less grateful I am for the blessings and the things that I have in my life. So put out good energy, serve others, be a good friend, be a good listener, be open to possibilities, and you will get, if you don't get everything you want the way you want it, you're gonna get something back that's even better than you can imagine. My advice is to try to re reconnect and um, you know be as courageous as possible because it, it feels like there's a lot of challenges and a lot of headwinds, right? Things that we took for granted are now much more difficult to accomplish. Um, but as long as we can rebuild trust and work in teams, um, you know, and also like be, be assertive and speak up about your ideas. Because I remember when I was um, in a young person, I felt like sometimes my ideas got overlooked. And I think that's that's what's really important about like what, what Jojo is doing, you know, she's has this role as moderator and, and what y'all are doing, asking questions that it's important for us to you know, be mentors and share our knowledge, but also listen to the questions that young people are saying. We had a history teacher uh, who really helped change my life. And, and in high school, I walked into the class, and the first day he goes up the chalkboard and he says, if you make between 90 and 100, you make a C, and you make between 80 and 90, you make a D, and everything below that, you fail. And my hand went up immediately, and I said, well, sir, I'm trying to get into college. How do you make it an A or an B in this class? And I said, he said, that's a good question. He said, on the side of my desk, I have a stack of papers. The stack of papers has 10 things to do. You don't have to do them. It's all extra credit. You don't have to do any of this. But if you do five of the 10 things, you get your grade uh, raised one letter. If you do the 10 of the 10, you get it raised two letters. And there were things that had nothing to do with history. I had to get a letter to the editor published in the newspaper. That was one of them. But it had nine other things to do. The lesson it taught me was if you do what's asked of you, you're average, you're a C. Nothing wrong with being a C student. C student's average, most people are C students. But to be better than a C student, you have to do better. You have to do more than what's asked of you. And if you want to be the best, you have to do even more. You want the satisfaction of doing, going beyond what's asked of you. And that makes a difference. Why are we here? We have businesses. Uh, we have very important things to do. But I will tell you, and I'll speak for the, the other panelists, is that today this is the most important thing we're doing. We're helping young people who at the beginning of their lives are making major decisions and we could be doing anything else, but this is without a doubt the most important thing we're doing today is spending our time helping you who are at the beginning of your lives.
Well, it looks like we're out of time. This has been fantastic and such a great opportunity for all of us to learn from each of you. I want to thank all of our guests for donating your time and wisdom. You're officially part of the AFIA family. Come back anytime. Finally, we want to thank the students for their great questions and support in the program. We hope you can take what you've learned today and apply it to be great. This has been Joe Salinas for AFIA. Thank you. That was really great. Again, big thanks to our guests for joining us and sharing your wisdom. Yes, thank you everyone for all your hard work in making this Dream Week event a success. As we leave you today, we hope that you can take time to reflect upon Dr. Martin Luther King's vision for our world. It's a dream that everyone at AFIA tries to make a reality each day. May we all be happy, healthy, and find a place to belong, find joy, and, and be, be great. great.